Hello, it's Haiku P podcast time again. I'm Patricia, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest podcast, Season 5, Episode 11. I hope wherever you are, you're enjoying beautiful weather, as we are here at P Towers in Switzerland. I'm happy you could join us today, as I'll be joined by the Haiku Foundation's Revirals editor, Keith Everts. I should warn you that there will be strong language and adult themes in the podcast today. So if you listen with your young children, and I know some of you do, perhaps listen to it alone first and see if it's something you could share. So what on earth could Keith be talking to us about today? Vulgarity. Vulgarity in your haiku and scenery writing. We'll look at its history, its evolution, and Keith will read us some examples. And then, of course, we'll discuss how far you can go in your writing, how vulgarity has changed over the ages. And Keith and I are going to have a disagreement. But as we're both British and terribly polite, you might miss it. Oh, and there's a little bit of homework for you too. Keith and I would really like to know your thoughts on today's podcast. So do please send them over to me and I'll share them with Keith. Before Keith and I head off into a world of vulgarity, I've got a few things to remind you about. You have until the 15th of June to get your submissions using memory to me. Please remember to use the new email. It's on the website. And of course, we don't accept submissions of fewer than four poems because it's really difficult to get into the rhythm of reading your work with fewer than that. There's a new video prompt on the YouTube channel. Don't forget to head over there and leave your haiku or senryu in the comments section. Linda Ludwig, our YouTube prompt editor, reads every single piece of work and makes a choice at the end of the month as to which poems should be featured on the podcast. And of course, if they're on the podcast, they'll be in the Poetry P Journal. I'm also thinking of topics for next year, so get your ideas across to me and let me know what you'd like to hear about, what you'd like to learn, what would make your haiku stronger. And so without further ado, let's get vulgar, shall we? Today I'm joined by Keith Everts. Keith, welcome to P Towers and the Haiku P podcast. Patricia, it's a great pleasure to be here. I discovered Poetry P only last year, and I think it's uh, wonderful the way you built up this community uh, with lots of stimulating stuff. So uh, let's hope I don't let it down. <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> so I know we've, we've had a few discussions leading up to today, so I'm, I'm very interested to see how, how it turns out. Now, Keith has specifically asked me to lower your expectations, as you, as you may guess from what he's just said. So without further ado, let's find out a little bit about him. He's a renegade biologist and retired diplomat who's lately persuaded editors to publish a couple of hundred haiku and short form poems, and even a few longer ones. He hosts the weekly haiku commentary feature on the Haiku Foundation, and for purposes of this workshop, describes himself as, as vulgar as the next man. Now in this workshop, we're going to talk about vulgarity. Keith, I know you've put a lot of work into this. We've had discussions, I've had a look at it, and I think we're gonna have some fun and even some controversy. Shall we get cracking? Why not? So in her Christmas greetings, circularized, uh, Patricia mentioned that she was working on a haiku that was, quote, a little naughty, probably not reaching the vulgarity of an ancient Japanese Renga verse. And we then had a, a merry email exchange about this and the drafting, and the upshot is this talk. And uh, being systematic, I'd like to start by defining vulgarity. It, its original meaning was of the common people. Um, the quality of being vulgar or unrefined or coarse. And in recent decades, of course, we've come to see it in particular as the coarse end 
of it, uh, the bawdy, the lewd, the rude. Um, and it's on that basis that we proceed, but I'd like to come back to its original meaning at the end of the talk. Now, a few hundred years ago, poetry in Japan was centered on a few educated people at court and courtly parties to write collaborative poems had pretty much exhausted their elegant themes. As literacy spread more widely, poets wanted to write verses that reflected more closely their everyday life, the life of the vulgar. And their collaborative efforts reflected this in haikai. One meaning of haikai is humorous verse, and I should say humorous rather than comic here, humor being a rather warmer uh, quality than comedy. So humorous verse, and some of it was pretty filthy as we're now going to see if you keep your eyes open. Now, this is a short extract from a, a collection in 1633, a famous one known as the Puppy Collection, and it is pretty filthy. Uh, here's a short extract translated by Robin Gill, um, who I, I might describe as a seminal author uh, in this question of um, vulgarity in uh, early haiku. So here are some lines from it, longing to go all the way as high as Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji links to, or the heights of Mount Fuji links to giddy from the sight of their fat white rumps, the snows of Fuji there. And then uh, nip those boys cheeks so you won't stay blue. Uh, forgive me if I don't go into the, the foul meaning of that. Um, and that links and shifts to, I'd be happy just to be a louse born in her undies. So um, that's just a sample. There, there are uh, a couple of thousand verses um, <laughs> along these lines, which I, I don't really think you want to go into unless you're a scholar. Uh, and I know what your next question is going to be. Yes, uh, they were all men mostly. And there were 178 haikai poets involved in this collection as it proceeded, and all but one uh, were men, the sole woman being identified only as Mitsusada's wife. Clearly, she'd been allowed out of the kitchen for the purpose. Um, I'll come back to this question of women poets later. Uh, the arrival then on the scene of Matsuo Basho towards the end of uh, the 1600s, elevated Renga or Renku to a more artistic and thoughtful level, using more common words, while the baser material continued to be written and continues to this day. And since Basha's time, verses that focus primarily on the human condition and use common language, <clears throat> if they're of some artistic quality, they evolved into senryu, and if base and of little or no artistic merit and, and rather filthy, they're known as zapai, a lovely word. And then zapai further divide into categories such as sarasen, salarymen or journeyman, senryu, day-to-day -day stuff often about political subjects. For example, enough is enough, those who prop up this letdown piss me off. I think you could agree that has little merit other than being a rant. Um, and and the, the man who, who wrote it, um, and it was published uh, in a, a journal specializing in this kind of stuff in Japan, uh, used an alias or pen name, as many of them do. And another category of zapai is known as baraku, which is just plain filth. Uh, baraku means break etiquette, and they do. And here's an example. This one's from the culture section of the India Times three or four years ago. It said, and it's, it's actually the least offensive of the 27 uh, uh, verses in that article. And it's happy Valentine's. May your nutsack be emptied with no diseases. I think you can agree that the author, much mushy Musashi, um, hasn't really contributed very much to our 
educational knowledge with this, uh, with this verse. Anyway, I'm going to ignore these now. You'll be relieved to hear. Uh, ignoring Zappi, we're going to uh, haiku. And by the way, I'm not going to make a distinction between hoku, because of course, at this stage, haiku hadn't been invented, and, and haiku, uh, nor am I going to make a distinction between haiku and senryu for the purpose of this talk. So now for haiku, the first one, ah, the bush warbler craps on the rice cakes at the veranda's edge. The next one, hey, boatman, no pissing on the moon in the waves. The next one, picking persimmons, my balls are cold, autumn wind. And the last, my balls get in the way of cooling air. And we'll take a look at these. Ah, the bush warbler craps on the rice cakes at the veranda's edge. This is Matsuo Basho, no less. Uh, rice cakes are a New Year tradition in Japan. And the Uguizu or bush warbler, to which such ceremonial rites are of no consequence, craps on them anyway. And Basho wrote to his disciple about this haiku in particular. He said, this is what I have been striving to compose. And he was aiming for what he called karumi or lightness. Aside from the light touch and, and the Buddhist acceptance of the bush warbler just getting on with its business, there is that slightly poignant resignation to the human condition where things are flawed rather than perfect. The rice cakes carefully prepared and just crapped on. And this is known in the Japanese aesthetic as mono no aware, the pathos of things. And there is makoto, sincerity or trueness to life. So it's more than just a vulgar verse. Hey, boatman, no pissing on the moon in the waves. And this is Kobayashi Issa. And anyone who spent time in a small boat will have the picture of the boatman with his bladder bursting, standing up in a rocking boat in which with his fresh humor, Issa defends the honor of the moon. And note how deftly, as usual, how deftly Issa sketches the scene for us with light, sound, and movement. Moving on, we have picking persimmons. My balls are cold, autumn wind. And this is Ryokan Taigo, uh, who was a realist and another Buddhist monk with a taste for sake and a wicked sense of humor. And here he juxtaposes cold round persimmons with his cold testicles. And a note for editors here, there, there are at least two season words here, if not three, and one in each line, in fact. Uh, but would you reject a submission from Ryokan on those grounds? I think not. Moving on. My balls get in the way of cooling air. This is one of a number of um, haiku about his testicles that Masao Kashiki wrote, um, the father of modern haiku as he lay sweating on his sickbed. And Shiki was dying of tuberculosis at a relatively young age. And he took his pen name Shiki after a common word for the Hototogizu, a Japanese cuckoo, which in stories is said to sing until it coughs up blood. And here his manhood is not merely useless at the age of 35, but an active inconvenience. And now a few more, we've got four more from Issa. Issa has actually got 20 or 30 um, haiku in, in this vein. Um, and they're all rather nice. This one, the poop scooper utterly smeared with butterflies. And cherry blossoms in yonder field pooping and pissing. Of course, most of us now use discrete sanitation systems rather than defecating and urinating, urinating in the fields. So some of the scenic juxtapositions that Issa reveled in are rather rare. Another one, the horses fart 
wakes me to see fireflies flitting. That's rather lovely. And his wife's period, uh, not a taboo subject. Her moon comes round. So we go moon viewing with the dog. I rather like that one. No more from Shiki. Shitting in the winter turnip field, the distant lights of the city. And here we have what I was just talking about, the rustic, rural, primitive society on the one hand, and the approaching but still distant civilization with its sanitary facilities. And Taneda Santoka, nonchalantly pissing off the road, soaking the young weeds which of course, I'm a gardener, uh, they would welcome the extra nitrogen. I'm sure if you're a gardener, you will have pissed on your compost for the same reason. But there are many more from acknowledged masters, notably Issa, but also Basho, Shiki, and even Chioni, who in the early 1700s to mid 1700s um, was a, a woman haikuist who was much influenced by Basho's writing and who became a nun. If you educate yourself on the sexual euphemisms of the times, some of her haiku have distinctly suggestive overtones. If you'd like to learn more about bawdy terms of, of the Edo period, I'll give a reference in the show notes. Um, for instance, if you come across old haiku about women going mushroom hunting, uh, particularly for the pine mushroom, be aware that the budding pine mushroom was seen as resembling the glans penis, with all that that implies. So before we move on, what have we learned from these old Japanese haiku masters? Well, everyday unmentionables are part of life, and they can be part of haiku or senryu, as much as camellias, swallows, dragonflies, and love. The precedents, as above, are impeccable. But it isn't sufficient simply to mention them, to use the naughty words, as a mischievous small child might, or a lewd travelling salesman in a bar. A smut alone is not enough. There's always something that elevates the verse beyond the vulgar language the stark facts of Shiki's condition, Issa's good-humoured defence of the moon. I love that. Basho's Zen bush warbler that gets on with its business. And by the way, it's at the veranda's edge. That is where the civilised world meets with the natural world. The juxtapositions, cold spherical objects as Ryokan picks persimmons, or Issa counterposes butterflies, cherry blossom, and fireflies, with the realities of pooping and farting. And the humour in Mr. and Mrs. Issa taking the dog moon viewing as lovemaking under the moon is suspended. So haiku spread westward after World War II, aided by the work of Japanologists like Reginald Blythe, and particularly to the USA, and some subversive poets took to the genre. Here's one by Ferlinghetti. Ancient frog in ancient outhouse. Plop. <laughs> this Ferlinghetti haiku may not have much merit, <laughs> but as a wayward honkadori, that is a haiku or senryu that references and perhaps adds to a well-known earlier one, did it make you laugh? I mean, clearly, he's referencing uh, uh, Basher's famous um, old pond, a frog jumps in the sound of water. But here we have a frog jumping into uh, a, an outhouse well with a plop. Uh, a plop is also a familiar word to users of the lavatory. But it has a little more than that, uh, as well as being a, a, a reference and a, an amusing takeoff of Basho's haiku, uh, you can imagine that an old and experienced frog is very happy to be in the outhouse on account of the flies. At least that's how I like to see it. 
And now Kerouac. We have had Kerouac in an excellent presentation on poetry P by Stanford Forrester recently, uh, which focused quite a lot on the spiritual side of Kerouac. Uh, but he also has a very much a worldly side, which you see in these three here. Lonely brick walls in Detroit, Sunday afternoon, piss call. And uh, I note that Kerak was never made poet laureate uh, by the authorities in Detroit. Nose hairs in the moon, my ass is cold. This is uh, <laughs> the realities of making love, as uh, signified by the moon, up close and personal. And the cow taking a big dreamy crap, turning to look at me. It's the insertion for me of, of the word dreamy, which makes this line. Uh, and it, this and the other ones have the overtones of sort of resignation and the feeling that, you know, he's a bit useless uh, that you see very much in, in Kerouac. Moving on to later poets, I'd like, first of all, to single out uh, Michael McClintock for his sparse purity when handling the impure and for examples of the use of the vulgar to shock, but with a purpose. So here are four by him. Long summer day, my neighbor's bull at it again. Now this is a bull doing what a bull's got to do. And for the bull, it's a long day's work. And the next one, <laughs> which is a very strange verse, um, but somehow deeply erotic, letting my tongue deeper into the cool, ripe tomato. And tomatoes will never be the same again. The next one, which will come to later, pushing inside until her teeth shine. Now, I see this as the half smile, half grimace of sexual ecstasy, pleasure given and received that McClintock has caught. And the fourth one, boom, go the guns, bowels. Very simple, but very graphic one that's given fresh relevance by the current war in, in Ukraine. Uh, he wrote a number of poems about his experiences in Vietnam, of which this is one. And this famous one with the shock, dead cat, open mouth to the pouring rain. And this, I think, is a tremendous sketch, haiku or senryu. Um, a cat is you know, normally a, a symbol of luxury and warmth and affection. And here we have a dead cat, open mouth to the pouring rain in the cold, caught by the shock of death, which can overtake anyone, anything at any time. A terrific haiku. And McClintock himself in a, an interview with Adria Neapolitan said, I want to see things as they are, not always as I would wish them to be. I want to write about what I find too, between the extremes of beauty and ugliness. I think that is where most of us live our lives. I think that's a splendid and enlightening quotation. In contrast with the earlier male dominated period, especially in Japan, uh, women in the English-speaking world, and later in Japan also, began to achieve freedoms. And today, it's estimated that over 60% of haiku and senryu are written by women authors. I remember one of my summer vacation jobs as a young student was to whitewash the walls of the local girls' grammar school toilets. And what I saw written there was far more shocking than anything I'd ever seen in the gents lose. And sure enough, their haiku, published in highly reputable journals, are at least as raunchy as the men's. So let's have a look. 
too drowsy to masturbate, Summer Noon by Jenna Lee in Frog Pong. Nude Show, the exhibitionist tweets that we all should come. This is Susan Birch, who is one of at least two lady specialists in this kind of thing. And she's uh, very much a writer of Kiyoka. Um, here we have a little more than just the double entendre of come, come to the show and, and come as an orgasm, uh, because she's inserted the exhibitionist, um, which really takes it up to a different level. He's so certain, or he, well, we assume it's a he. <laughs> That's my assumption. We assume it's a he, and he's, he's assuming that we should all find him so orgasmic uh, that we'll come. And the third one, oneness, peeing in the rain. And we are 60% water after all. So we're pretty nearly one. And now Carol Reisfeld, um, who is another saucy poet with a twinkle in her eye, but, but doesn't only concentrate on these. She's written some extremely good, I could send you uh, prize winning ones, in fact. So here are four that I particularly like. Viagra heist, police still looking for the hardened criminals. And aside from the double entendre of hardened here, the second line of this haiku, police still looking, hints that the effects of Viagra endure for quite a while and that the police may be keen to get their hands on the loot. So I think you've got uh, more than one little joke for your money there. The next one, between snores and a tick of the clock, an erection. What is he dreaming about, we think? The next one, sudden windbreak. Everyone pauses to stare at the dog. This is the tendency of guilty humans to pin the blame elsewhere, more generally, but in particular, this uh, sudden fart. And lastly, fainting at the sound of the F word. She misses the sunset. Note that Carol hasn't actually used the word fuck here, but F word, um, which again is quite delicate. Uh, it's, it implies that the, the woman who's fainting um, wouldn't even use the word normally, uh, uh, but has, has put the F word euphemism in there. And she misses the sunset. This is the other side of Issa being woken by his horse farting and seeing fireflies. Here, a fainting maiden misses not only the joy of sex, but the sunset too. And then we have a, a rather more serious uh, woman author, at least she tackles uh, rather difficult and serious questions. Laurie A. Minor, exposing the stamen, fuck boy. Now, it might be easy just to react against this as uh, yet another shot in the gender wars and groan. But there's more to it than disparaging the street fuckboy. And, and a fuckboy, according to the Urban Dictionary, is a guy who'll tell a girl anything to get them to hook up. A complete jerk who flirts with multiple girls at a time and makes them all believe they're individually special. But here, the poet is juxtaposing uh, this street word of disparagement with the male organ of a flower uh, that welcomes any pollinator that comes along, and which is what a flower does naturally. Now it leaves us wondering, well, is this fuckboy behavior just nature? Anyway, at, at this point, I think uh, having bombarded you with vulgar verses, I will um, ask Patricia uh, what she makes of it all. I know that she has a few questions. Patricia. 
So yes, Keith, as you alluded to during the workshop, we all know that women are just as capable of being a little risque as the menfolk. Um, in fact, I was listening to you wondering if in fact you were painting my school during your holiday times. <laughs> but in the, um, in the puppy collection of 1633, there was only one poem from a woman. Can you remember or do you know what it was? I'm afraid not. I mean, in that collection, there are something like 2,000 verses, 178 poets, and I don't have it to hand. And I rather doubt that she would have been identified um, by line with that uh, particular line, whichever one it was. Okay. But uh, of course, in, in those days, there were very few women haikuists. Uh, the situation has changed over the years. Um, we have, for instance, at the end of the 1600s, there was one collection with 36 verses by 36 different women poets. And then in the 1700s, you had a few more. Uh, there's a very good uh, book by Makoto Ueda, which I give in the show note references called uh, Far From the Field which deals with the evolution of uh, uh, women haikuists and their verses. And I commend that to you. Um, and now the situation is very much different. Uh, Ueda states that uh, by about 2000, 70% of uh, haikuists in Japan were women. And uh, the little graph we have here is from uh, is the statistics of the largest Facebook haiku group of, of which I'm a moderator, shown with permission. So there are 13,600 members of this group. Not all of them are, are authors. Um, many of them are readers, but they are all interested and engaged with haiku. And you can see that uh, the blue bars, which are the female proportion, um, in increase, if anything, um, as well as the age, and collectively 68% of the group membership is female, 31% male, and 1% custom. The age distribution is also interesting, um, so I would perhaps conclude that the more seasoned you are, the more you're likely to be uh, an appreciator of haiku. I did a, a, a quick check on Poetry P's selections for the podcast on colour, and 61% of haiku were from women authors, and 39% from men. And just this last week, um, I had a look at the Touchstone Awards shortlist and long list, and did some ca calculations on my envelope, and 65% of these uh, best haiku and senryu are by women, 35% by men. So I think the case now is, is pretty clear. There's plenty of evidence that a majority of haikus and successful ones are women. That's very interesting. I wonder why. That's a whole, I bet that's probably a whole other podcast. So we'll, we'll move on. Now, you said before that we're going to go back to one of the McClintock poems. And so we are. And I'm going to ask you the question, erotic or porn, ac acceptable or not? And it's about this one. Pushing inside until her teeth shine. Pushing inside until her teeth shine. Now, I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer the erotic or porn question. And as you noted, when we discussed it before, you said that the the half smile, half grimace um, of sexual ecstasy was about giving and relishing physical pleasure. So possibly you're on the erotic side of the argument. But my story when I read it is a little different. And what I see is the physical pleasure of the chap without knowledge or acknowledgement of how she is feeling. So I thought I'd, I'd change the perspective and, and read it like this pushing inside until my teeth shine, pushing inside until my teeth shine. And I was really looking at that from the female perspective, although it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. 
but looking at it from the peak female perspective, it still felt ambiguous to me, but possibly with a little humor, which would change it slightly for me. But ultimately I came back to the, the end result being, I don't know how she feels. And I wonder how she would feel about this description of the act and can't help feeling that it's a, a little bit like locker room talk for me. So is it acceptable or is it not? And again, it's going to be a personal point of view. But if we try and look at it, look at it objectively, if, if you can with a poem, we can ask ourselves a few questions. Is it haiku? I don't think it is. And we've spoken a few times recently on the podcast and in the Poetry P Readings podcast about haiku and senryu, suggesting that haiku and senryu are on a spectrum of short form poems. And so I'll just add to the spectrum at the far end from haiku through senryu to um, what I'm now going to add, short form micro poems. And think that maybe this, this particular one comes somewhere between the senryu and the short form. But does it rise above plain filth? I think probably uh, it does. Mm. Yes, I think, I think it does. I mean, I, I don't see it as a haiku or, or senryu either. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, uh, you know, you, would, you wouldn't get in a senryu journal these days, um, but, perhaps, but perhaps it should. I see it more as a, um, a very original and catching phrase that might be suited to a, a novel, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey or something like that. But it does, um, and our discussion uh, does uh, push us towards, uh, if pushing is the right word, push us towards a few um, speculative conclusions. I mean, the first point I would make is that, as in all art, writers go beyond the boundaries and they challenge. And some works of art and some books are kept away from public view as too offensive. But the key word here is, is art. That is, is there something in this which takes it uh, beyond the level of just bawdy or obscene? And does McClintock add something here? Uh, I think he does. Um, so it passes that test for me. It isn't just, you know, a, a brutal, vulgar line. Mm. It is actually conveying a moment of sorts. And the other point I thought about after our uh, preliminary chat on this is that um, more than other forms, haiku and senryu rely on the reader mm. to complete the circle of meaning. And you read McClintock's poem one way, yeah. And I read it another, and neither of us is right or wrong. Yeah. Um, but if a verse is not explicitly vulgar, not explicitly vulgar, but is seen to have a naughty meaning, who's responsible for that? I mean, is that the writer or is it the reader? Um, and indeed, this is an exploitable technique. For instance, I could... Uh, write the first two lines of a, of a senryu um, coming inside before I can stop him. And you would be thinking, perhaps you would be thinking, this is, gosh, um, without consent, this is, this is rape. But then, as you're having this particular thought, I come in with a third line, next door's cat. So all I'm saying, innocently, is coming inside before I can stop him, next door's cat. And they do, they do, as you know. <laughs> yes. So um, it's a technique that, that uh, a number of uh, people, uh, a number of poets relying on humor use, that is to lead the reader into supposing one thing, mm -hmm. and then um, innocently come up with a, a third line, which says, oh, no, it's not about that at all. It's, it's in your mind. We'll put this to, to our listeners, Keith, and say, get in touch and let us know. I'd be really interested to know, are there people who see it as I do, if you like, I see it as locker, locker room humour and possibly slightly um, unpleasant, 
uh, you see it very differently. So get in touch and let us know and I'll feed back to Keith uh, and we'll see. Yeah, it would I'm, be very interesting. It would be very interesting. Very interesting. And I think um, I'm really interested to see if there's a, going to be a male female split. On the whole, I'll come down because it's a beautifully crafted piece of work. And I would say to you, really have a look also at the way he's put it on the page because I think that's, there's some suggestive work within the, the way he's laid it out on the page mm. too. Um, so yes, uh, acceptable. I'm it's still, I'm, you know, I'm still dithering. I could still fall over that fence and say, no, I wouldn't have it. And my last question then, Keith, is about the, the language, the, the way we now use language um, to be a little bit risque. It's become... I think you used the word possibly about one of Carol Raisford's uh, a bit more delicate in contemporary times, which I found very interesting. And the other thing I noticed is that you've got quite a gap between 2010, 2020 in your examples. And I wondered if that was because there's a difficulty or you have found a difficulty in finding examples in, in that period. And if that's the case, can we then jump and surmise that we as poets are self-censoring what do you think well it's a, it's an interesting question um and uh, uh, as you alerted me i've managed to uh, dig up some more um here are some more recent ones and i must say that that well let let's tackle the point first so in recent years it seems to be that the english language haiku in general have become more lyrical and emotional and less sort of matter of fact with cold images. Um, and, and then the role of editors, and there are an increasing number of female editors, is another important factor in selecting and shaping the content that we read. So it may be that people are still writing these things, but not submitting them. Uh, and it's for consideration whether the overall softer tone if that has actually developed, maybe due to the civilizing element of a majority of women, but let's not go there. Um, there are still plenty of examples in, in Senryu, uh, but that doesn't mean there's no self-censorship. All I would say that in spite of possible self-censorship, um, there's still quite a lot of it about. And, and here are some very recent ones. So the first one, summer lust, her fart wouldn't stop me. And this, of all people, this is from a chat book devoted to the fart called Peace of My Fart with, a, with an introduction, a positive introduction from Mike Railing uh, by Ajay Agyei Bar, who is the esteemed and august editor of the Mamba Africa Press. And um, I might say that the submission guidelines for the Mamba African Press explicitly exclude vulgarity. There's a whole book of this, and um, I'm, I'm not exactly going to recommend it, but if you're interested, uh, then you can look at a lot of farting scenarios. Another one by Alan Pete, who's a, 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 a very well-known haiku and short form poet and haibunist. Uh, too old to give a shit, making up with the windows wide open. I quite like that one. I sometimes kiss Mrs. Evitz in the front garden so that the neighbours can see. Another one by Roberta Beach Jacobson, um, who has a very lively sense of humour in her verse. Long day writing, too tired to conjugate. And you have the, the double entendre there. And she edits the Cold Moon Journal, which is uh, one of my favourites which has a very wide variety diet of, of material in it, including some of mine, which is why I like it. And this one is Thor, rapidly shrinking snowman's genitalia, a phrase that rolls off the tongue. But uh, whether or not you think this has any insight <coughs> or merit, um, it certainly topped the Cold Moon hit parade um, for at least four weeks. Uh, measured in terms of number of hits. So that tells you something, at least about popularity. Um, so I think the answer to your question is yes, there's still plenty of this kind of thing being written. There is, of course, a huge amount of, of the inferior stuff still being written in Japan. A another reference I give 
um, is to a very good article in the Juxta magazine dealing with um, these uh, Saracen, the political type of, of ranting haiku or senryu. Um, and you'll find a lot of material there, which is very, very current. So yes, uh, there is still plenty about, um, but that doesn't mean that people aren't self-censoring on some of the issues. Mm. And perhaps at, at this point, um, if you agree, we could sort of recap and round up and try to draw some conclusions. Yes, please. Well, what we've learned from the haiku that, that we've had in the presentation, uh, we needn't shy away from the impolite, but there has to be a good reason for it. And plain filth isn't enough. There must be some genuine haiku or senryu merit in the verse, some art. A more serious haiku can shock with their reality, not just for the sake of being shocking, but with space to suggest some inference to make the reader think, to take it up a level or two. Or they can juxtapose the sublime with the earthy, as Issa does so often. This is how things are, the good and the bad, the beautiful and the ugly. Or as McClintock says, the space between the beautiful and the ugly is where most of us live our lives. And then warm human humour rather than ironic comic humour uh, or nasty humour may help sell the verse and draw the reader into some universal appreciation of a common situation. And laughter is a very unifying thing, I think. And for Freud, laughter occurs when a forbidden thought or feeling is freed from its repressed state. And Schopenhauer saw the essence of humour as the disharmony between what we know in theory and what we see in actuality. In the next slide, I tried to draw up a few categories of the acceptable and unacceptable, which uh, at least is something to think about. And I thought category one, um, and this covers most of the ones that we've had in the presentation, uh, going back to the Japanese masters. So anatomy and physiology are okay male and female parts, menstruation, menopause. I know you've had some on menopause in, in the Poetry P journal yeah. over the past year. Erections or, or failing to erect. Urination, defecation, belching and farting. It's a great list, isn't it? Anything anti-violence or on the adverse effects of, of violence. Are there are precedents that are very well established for all of these. A green light for that, as long as it's done artistically. Uh, category two, proceed with caution. And here we have things which can be very sensitive, uh, particularly for people that have had direct experience of so prostitution, drugs, alcoholism, anorexia, obesity, the gender nexus, uh, any conditions that are stigmatized. And some of these are best left to those with their own experience of them. Um, not necessarily their own direct experience of them, but perhaps uh, one of a carer or a friend who's experienced the effects of them. Um, that that might be something to examine uh, to proceed with caution. Um, one that occurred to me since I drew the list up was say sexual diseases. It seems to me there's a field to explore there. Um, the communication of diseases. There are one or two older ones. Um, in the particular one by John Stevenson, now I come to think of it, which I can't remember exactly, um, about uh, AIDS in the, in the AIDS period. Um, but it seems that the, the mix of, you know, love, lust and guilt uh, could be a very rich field to exploit in, uh, in San Rio. Category three, red alert, anything pro-violence, rape, castration, bondage, sexual practices, karma sutra positions, anal penetration. 
love or sex with minors or serious misogyny or misandry. But again, I say red alert, and this is a very dangerous area. If, if handled at all, then with extreme care, I, I mean that. But it's not impossible. Moving on to a few criteria that might be applied by authors in, in the creative process. Um, directness of experience, writing about what you know uh, is, is a good principle anyway. Uh, and here it, it might uh, help to exclude um, you know, fanciful um, or derogatory or political um, positions that, that you have not been directly involved in yourself. And then channeling ESA, write with loving kindness and warmth and not hostility or aggression. Universality, and here we come back to the very first slide, the meaning of vulgar, which is common. And universality is the things we have in common. Uh, it means that your readers uh, are likely to be able to relate to what you write. Um, otherwise, what's the point? Privacy is another one that occurred to me. Uh, if you're writing um, a line of, of, of vulgar senryu, would you be happy to be identified as its author? Um, if you wrote about your ex, are you going to be happy to have that still in the publishing canon um, in 10 years time? Um, if you're writing about your wife, is she going to be happy to, buy, to be identified in, in your verse? I think this is an issue which uh, uh, comes to the fore particularly in, in vulgarity in haiku. And then the old Japanese principle of ma, what is left unsaid. You don't have to be, and perhaps you shouldn't be, explicitly vulgar but uh, uh, be vulgar about common things, about the unmentionable things without mentioning them, mm -hmm. leaving the interpretation to the reader. And lastly, as has been very clear, humor with uh, a light touch. Anyway, uh, in the show notes, I've listed some reference works in the appendix. Um, one of which is, is a seminal work I'll, I'll mention now, um, <clears throat> which is uh, The Woman Without a Hole and Other Risky Themes in Old Japanese Poems. And this is by Robin D. Gill. It's a remarkable book. You can read most of it uh, online with just a few pages taken out by Google. Um, and uh, it, it is a, a very scholarly work. Uh, by a bilingual interpreter who's devoted a great deal of his time to studying uh, vulgar haiku um, from the masters onwards. And there isn't an area that, that he leaves un, untouched, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, but it is a very interesting book. It's a very idiosyncratic book. For instance, he, he doesn't bother to edit and revise. He, um, if there's something he's written earlier, that he later decided he didn't like. He leaves it in, but with, with um, striking it out, there's a line crossing it out, which is very interesting because you can see how his thinking's evolving. But it certainly means that many scholars wouldn't regard it as a scholarly work. Anyway, that's, that's one I would recommend. Um, another, um, I think um, I'll give you the means to search for it, and I do put it in the notes. And this is examples of things we don't want to see. Um, and it's the one in the India Times. If you search for 27 haiku, which are nasty, uh, India Times, you'll come across it. And uh, it, they are 27 nasty haiku, and they are just plain filth. And it's the kind of thing that I'm sure Patricia doesn't want to have to deal with. No, <laughs> would need a very long barge pole. Anyway, um, I must also thank, before I close, Charles Trumbull, um, who has a marvelous database of haiku, and he helped me to source some of the publication references of several of the less well-known haiku that have been used today. 
And I hope you agree it's been worthwhile examining the subject, Patricia. It's been interesting to research. And I hope my name won't be sullied forever. In John Stevenson's word, a crowded street. I'm the one who steps in it. Thank you very much. Ethan, thank you very much for this entertaining and thought provoking workshop. It's going to be very interesting to, to get the feedback. So, as I said before, do email us or email me and I'll pass on your feedback to Keith too. But you know, we've not heard the last of Keith because he's going to be back as one of the judges for this submission topic. So do please show him what you can do. Be creative, not crude. But you know what? I trust your judgment. Send us what you think is appropriate. So make me think and make me smile. <laughs> That's a good one. Thanks, Keith. It was a real treat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Bye now. Bye. Well, that was a little bit different, wasn't it? Thank you, Keith. What did you think of the podcast? And specifically, we'd love to hear your thoughts and views on McClintock's poem. So I'm going to get back to reading your memory submissions. If you haven't sent them yet, don't miss the deadline the 15th of June. Because missing the deadline is an automatic rejection because I'm absolutely ruthless. Thank you for all the coffees you've bought for me or donations you've made via PayPal. Due to popular demand, I've added a PayPal button to the website. Slowly, slowly, I'm inching forward to being able to give someone an internship and a career which I hope they'll love. Oh, and if you've signed up for the mailing, I'll be sending out a list of publications that will take speculative poetry. If you've not signed up, do it when you finish listening to this, because if your memory is anything like mine, you'll forget. It's been lovely to have your company today, and I hope you'll join me next time when I'll read to you your original speculative haiku and send you. It was another bumper submission period, and there are so many super pieces to read to you, not to mention a fantastic judging panel, just as long as the Mogwai stay dry. Until we meet again, keep writing. And if I've missed anything out, please let me know and I'll sort it out for you. Ciao.